Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Adam Hawkins. In each episode, I present a small batch of the theory and practices behind building a high-velocity software organization. Topics include DevOps, Lean, software architecture, continuous delivery, and conversations with industry leaders. Now, let's begin today's episode. Today, I'm honored to speak with Dr. Mick Kirsten. Mick Kirsten is the author of the best-selling book, Project to Product, which introduced the Flow Framework. He's also the CEO of TaskTop. I introduced the Flow Framework on small batches through an episode on the four types of work. That episode is a wonderful prelude to this conversation. Find that one at smallbatches.fm slash nine. I invited Mick on small batches to discuss the Flow Framework's origin story. From there, we move on to how the ideas in Project Product dovetail into the three ways of DevOps. This is one of my favorite aspects of Project to Product. I happened to read the DevOps handbook before reading Project to Product. So as I was reading the book, I noticed that there's a strong focus on value streams and how to optimize them and start thinking to myself, well, this sure feels a lot like DevOps, but zoomed out to the entire organization. Well, yes, it's true that DevOps connects engineering to the ideas of business value, But the flow framework takes it one step further by treating the entire business as a value stream with customers on one end and business results on the other. We also discuss that a bit in this episode. Our conversation hits the intersection of software architecture, value stream architecture, and team architecture, all the notes that organizations must conduct for effective software delivery. And this is also, I think, kind of where the sweet spot of small batches is. There's also a detour into structure and dynamics. I suggest listening to a few episodes of Gene Kim's podcast with Dr. Steven Spear to learn more. You may also remember structure and dynamics from the previous episode on team topologies. Links to all those episodes at smallbatches.fm slash 21. You know, I'm overjoyed to have Mick on the show because he spotlights what really matters. That's flow time. Or in other words, Optimize for fast flow, and the rest comes along for the ride. Anyway, you'll hear it all from him in his own words. Now, I give you my conversation with Dr. Mick Kirsten. Mick, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm so happy to talk to you. Great to be here, Adam. Thank you for having me. Right. So I've already done an episode on the flow framework, introducing the idea through the four types of work. But I'm, I think the audience would like to know about the context, like the epiphanies that you mentioned in product to product that led to the creation of the flow framework. So can you give us some of that background? Yeah, absolutely. So for the entire of my career, I've been studying software value streams. You know, initially as a developer, uh, working on open source projects. That, and then it, I think for me, it got really interesting to study software at scale. And you kind of get a sense, an intuitive sense for how to deliver value, Uh, how to contribute to, let's say for me, it was to an open source community by doing more certain kinds of work. But then you also get the sense of of the things that get in the way of that work, right? Where you've got sort of, it might be a lack of automation, might be a problem with software architecture. And I started doing more and more visualizations actually of the flows of work. I realized also that, you know, I was initially obsessed with studying code bases to understand software architecture. And then I realized, well, if we actually study, if we, we, we assume that software delivery is, is this creative process, it's a, it's a design process, it involves design thinking and conversations, then we've got this amazing body of, of work to study that a lot of the ground truth of software is actually captured in the conversations mm. that people have in a software, what we now call a software value stream. And so there are, those are pull requests by developers. Uh, those are conversations on specific issues or user stories or tickets or customer information. And I started studying more and more of the communication, the flow of information on those things and on how they interact with the source code. I started, I did, created this one visualization that actually showed me how when you had a lot of conversation on a, on a specific kind of issue on an open source project, that would actually start changing the software architecture around that conversation. So it was this really interesting interaction and really understanding the different types of work led me to realize, okay, well, if we want to understand what flows in software delivery, we actually need to understand the fundamentals sort of on, on first principles, what those flow items are. And from that, I tried to create the simplest possible representation of the different types of work item flow 
And that's really where the four flow items came from. Mm-hmm. So features, defects, risks, and debts. And then after that, it was really a case of studying if every single tool that we mm-hmm. knew, because at TaskDoff, we have the benefit where we actually understand both the kind of default schema of every single agile DevOps product management tool out there. And so we actually looked at every single one of their schemas and say, well, how do they allow you to model work, right? How do the service desks, like a ServiceNow or a Zendesk or something, allow you to model work? And then we had one more piece of data, which was our customers' value streams. In the book, I built this around seeing the artifacts of 308 different organizations' value streams and what flows in them. So what, what kind of issues and defects and features and risk items do they work on? And of course, then there's been the work of the scaling frameworks, right? Frameworks mm-hmm. like the Scaled Agile framework or, or Scrum frameworks and Nexus and so on, and seeing how they had were categorized. And from that, I realized, well, it, it really does boil down when we take the perspective of not this fine-grained decomposition that happens when we're trying to plan work and prioritize work, which is really important to the Agile frameworks, but when we think about the, the value that we deliver to the customer, because that's, that's the whole point of the flow frameworks, to, to think product, value stream-centric, customer-centric, there are only these four, four types of work. And if we actually understand that these, these things are trade-offs that we make against each other, we can make better decisions and we can surface the kinds of decisions that developers make for themselves every day or development teams make for themselves to the business for a better understanding of, of these trade-offs between investment technical debt versus feature delivery and so on. So it really came from a very personal experience of making these trade-offs to working with teams to saying, okay, there's, we, we've got to have a way of, of understanding these dynamics of flow and the trade-offs that we make and then doing this, this broader study. Hmm. Yeah, so one of the epiphanies you mentioned in the book was the realization that uh, the, f- the value streams are not linear, but they're actually networks. And uh, it seems like on its face, that might be obvious, but if you sort of look at, say, how the work happens, especially in open source, where you have like clear boundaries between things that are part of the project and really not part of the project. You know, like if you're working in a bigger company, you might have a team who's, you know, in the same department as you or in the, definitely in the same organization that you can work with. Whereas if you're working on a sufficiently complex open source project, you might have to go over to this repo, these other maintainers, and work with them. And that kind of fans out into this broader network of things. So like once you had the network, like the value stream network, maybe you can just talk a little bit about that. I'm not sure if the listeners are familiar with that concept and how important it is. Yeah, absolutely. So I think like a lot of people, I try to sort of, when you try to envision what flows in software deliveries to better understand how to improve flow, how to deliver more, um, how to have fewer wait states and friction and so on, when, you start, when I start to visualize it, I, I often came back to this picture a lot of us have in our minds, which is of this delivery pipeline, right? Um, you've got this continuous delivery pipeline, and but I started realizing that we're not really delivering releases. Like what when you when you when you're working with continuous delivery, when you're working with a, a cloud mindset, but you just stop thinking about releases, mm. right? Because releases are something that actually can be automated, and it really should be automated right? It's critical to automate your delivery. So you're not the pipe, this notion of a pipeline where you're delivering releases, it just felt so antiquated to me. Uh, and the notion that it's linear is, is also seemed completely wrong. Because when I did these initial visualizations of how conversations on issues, on pull requests and so on, actually the structure of those conversations, because issues are linked, they're linked to source code, they're linked to build and so on. I realized that what you're really seeing is, is this network of teams and the dependencies between those teams and sometimes people, right? Because you'll have uh, a person on, a, on part of the infrastructure or the SRE team who's really closely in conversation with someone on a feature team who's responsible for operations of this particular product and so on. So the underlying structure is this network where the nodes are people and teams. And that's just something, again, as with the flow items, it's just something I empirically observed. So then it was a question of really, you know, helping to simplify that into something that can be meaning for us to to help and to optimize the flow of software delivery. And I think the key thing is that these 
concept of value, we need a concept that's bigger than the team. Mm. Because if we're always optimizing for just the team, we fail to, to optimize around those dependencies. And that's a lot of what's happened in my experience mm. in, the, in Agile and DevOps. Not, not so much intentionally, but there's been s- such great support in terms of tooling, in terms of practices, in terms of training for making teams work better. But once we actually dig into an organization's value stream flow, we see that as soon as they fix some of the easier stuff, like some long dependency on waiting on screens from, from the graphic designer or something of that sort, or some lack of automation for, for some you know, security testing, uh, we actually see that the wait states come from dependencies between teams. Mm. So I realized that we need a way of conceptualizing and visualizing and understanding a value stream, something that's at, a, at the team of teams levels construct. And once you do that, you actually see that both within a, a product value stream and across them, you have this network structure, right? You have this collaboration, these conversations happening, and that's what you really need to understand because that structure, if you've got a mismatch between that structure and what you're trying to deliver to the market or a mismatch between that structure and your software architecture, that's where all your wait states will be. That's where things get caught up. So, so the key thing to me was to understand that there, there is this other structure that we need to think at a level above the team. And, and then that's, we need to be able to understand flow and, and to basically measure flow mm-hmm. to, 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 to get the bottlenecks out of the path of our teams, right? Because the, the, this is the part of the problem of sort of the maturity that there is in the industry around teams and the lack of maturity at the team of teams level is that the bottlenecks tend to be outside the teams. It's an external dependency. It's an organizational dependency. Uh, it's those things that are wrong. And that's, what, that's why the flow framework focuses so much at that team of teams level, where again, what we see in the structure is, uh, is, is not the simple pipeline, but it's actually this, this value stream network. So you mentioned, I think, maybe like the missteps between Agile and DevOps and focusing on some of these dependencies. And I'm curious on your opinion of, like, do you think that maybe that happened because sort of like a bottom-up type of approach of maybe taking a more like engineering focused view of like engineering as it relates to the wider organization. Because of course, DevOps and those ideas, they are definitely focused on delivering business value, but they're still like largely tech centric. And one thing I think the flow framework does really well is it takes that perspective and takes it completely from one end to the business on the other end, the customer. And you have the idea of the flow metrics, like flow velocity, efficiency, time and load, and then the business results on the other end. So how does the flow framework sort of rela- outside of the, the, the value stream network, with the focus on those metrics and the top them approach, how do you think that that either like surfaces or addresses this dependency problem you mentioned? Right. Yeah. So I think, first of all, in terms of directional goals, I think that was as, as set aside by Gene Kim and the others in, in the Phoenix project the goal of DevOps was kind of end-to-end flow and feedback and continual learning, right? It was, it was about the end-to-end delivery of value, right? And those are the three ways of DevOps, which the flow framework very much builds on. The thing that I think happened is that some of these concepts got, get, they get, they kind of got stuck at the team level or the delivery pipeline level, right? Because for a lot of organizations, and this is why DevOps is so important, and the DevOps movement is so important, for a lot of organizations, the, their continuous integration, continuous delivery practices were so poor, that mm-hmm. was an obvious bottleneck. If you can, you know, you've got dev teams who are getting better for a decade with agile practices, and you've got, you know, weeks or sometimes longer in terms of actually getting software into production, that was an obvious problem. But in terms of principles, the three ways of DevOps were about, were about the end-to-end flow of value. And so really my goal with the flow framework is to, to get unstuck from something A, the teams and developers already understand is that if they've got upstream or downstream bottlenecks, they know those are getting in their way. If they've got technical debt, that's making it difficult for them to deliver features at the rate that they would like to. Again, they understand that, it, that an architectural investment in APIs needs to be made. And so the goal of the flow framework is to basically expose those dynamics from, from the small, from just thinking these things are only important at the CI, CD pipeline level or the dev team level to say, no, these are important at the end-to-end organization level. Right? If we have constant wait states on a meeting that's being rescheduled every two weeks and we still don't have input into you know, th- this particular set of constraints or what the performance of the system should be, what the scale should be, what the design of this thing should be, well, that can become our bottleneck. And it's not 
that these bottlenecks, again, I think the interesting ones are the ones that fall outside of the teams because the ones of inside the teams we've, we've become better at solving. So it really is, the flow framework is as simple as I think what you alluded to there, Adam, which is to take these concepts that, that have worked and we understand within the delivery team and make them bigger and make them the everyone's problem, right? Make them something that the whole organization is looking at optimizing its flow time to bring value to market faster. It's not that it's just the responsibility of the dev or just the responsibility of the, of the ops team and so on. That's what I think is actually so powerful about the four types of work is that it gives a mutually exhaustive categorization of all the things that the business can do. And this fits well between integrating or like mapping between product and engineering because you can see that, you know, okay, if you had hypothetically a security incident, then working on sort of risk items to mitigate that or like paying back technical debt as a means to, you know, meet like continued flow time. I think this is something that you also talked about in on your podcast with Adrian Cockroft, which is the focus on flow time. Like if you focus on flow time, so many other things uh, come come out of that. And just for the listener, flow time is sort of the measurement of how long it takes an organization to do something that results in business value. I mean, that you can probably find a more precise definition, but the overall concept is how fast is your overall value stream performing. And you also mentioned that the flow framework builds on the ideas of DevOps. And in DevOps, like the DevOps handbook, they talk about value streams a lot. And this is also present in project to product. And when I read the the book, I'm reading it, I'm nodding along. I'm like, there's a lot of stuff about value streams and I'm thinking about DevOps and I'm thinking of sort of the virtuous feedback loop of DevOps where you have flow, which leads to feedback. And if you can continually learn, you can continually optimize that and things start to get going faster. And we can sort of transition the conversation, but uh, how in your mind was like, did you see the flow framework as sort of building on the ideas of DevOps, but applied in a different um, sort of different context? Or is it just sort of a continuation of like thinking in this direction? It's a continuation. So I think again, the the and in, in you know many chats with Gene Kim and others in the DevOps community was is just a continuation. It's, it's, I think there was an initial success in terms of the impact that DevOps has been able to make, and then the question is, I think to me is what's next? Given mm. it's not sufficient to do this, we you know we need flow and feedback in an end to end way. We need that to feed back into business planning. We need people doing business strategy to understand the effect of technical debt and to prioritize it. Because we know that when they don't, and it's only the technical teams who understand these concepts, you end up with just very mismatched understandings of the world and and dynamics that don't make sense. So that was really the the goal of the flow frame is to say, okay, what's next for DevOps is to basically become part of the way that the business functions, not just the way IT functions. And we need to break through the fact that the business side and the technology side, the IT side, have two different operating models and two different ways of measuring things and to create one way of measuring things that's at a high enough level of abstraction to make sense for the business side, right? Because part of the other problem I was noticing is that in large organizations, well, in all sizes of organizations, the way that sort of the executives and management and leadership tends to, to measure things and the words that they use are very different for the mm. words, the way technologists thinks about things. And so I just want to create a common language because the technology side, when we are, you know, we really care about things like, you know, chain success rate and some of these other important metrics, those need to be up-leveled because fundamentally all that the, the business or the customer cares about is the quality of their experience and how many new features they got in the last release. And that's, that's, that's really what gets them excited about continuing to use some, some digital experience that you're creating. So, so it was really for me, I guess, taking that helping take catalyze what DevOps started to do and make it easier for the business to adopt as an operating model because mm-hmm. of the fact that the whole goal of identifying, modeling, and measuring these product value streams and the four flow items was really to expose the dynamics of software delivery in a way that's understandable to the business. Mm-hmm. And that allows the right kind of decisions to be made. So just a, just a sidebar here. So wh- when you're mentioning dynamics, are you referring to the concept of structure and dynamics or something else? So I think that I, I really like what 
the journey that Jean Kim's been on recently on structure and dynamics. Mm-hmm. And yes, so it's 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 the same concept, right? The dynamics as in it's not like you've got sort of a silver bullet for saying, well, do this to make delivery go faster. But if you've got the right way of representing flow and visualizing flow, you can actually see within the dynamics that within the way information is moving in the organization. And of course, the flow items are, are one measure of that, right? Uh, your meetings might be another measure of that. What it takes to get an approval might be another measure of that mm-hmm. for something. So all of those things are, I think, in the broader category of dynamics. And the structures, of course, you know, the, what, what you have organizationally and from a process point of view. And so I wanted to have an easy way to measure and visualize the dynamics of software mm. from the point of view, again, of, of these kinds of trade-offs that you have to make. That if you want to reduce time to market, here's what you'll need to change. If you, you know, ignore technical debt by over-focusing on features, this is what the outcome of that will be. And so that these are these are conscious decisions made at a at a business level, not just things that are hidden, mm. and that you know let's say the that some developers do in their in their spare time to make sure that the, the platform that you're building doesn't doesn't fall apart completely. That's why I really like the graph, the flow distribution, because you can imagine sort of like a fader, right? If you're putting all the work into features, then you're not putting any work into say risks or debts. And I don't know what your experience has been, but I've been in teams where. They've been on features and bugs for so long, but then there's been no work on debts, and then the chickens come home to roost, and then there's some new business requirement that comes in, and then we can't make it because we haven't invested in act, in paying down any of these debts. Yeah, exactly, and and that's the whole point is that it's a it's a conscious and deliberate decision. If you're going to slide that fader that much to features, you need to understand the effect that's going to happen three, six, and nine months from now, mm-hmm. and not complain at that point. So there's a conscious decision. Yeah. So now that we're on structure and dynamics, I want to bring the conversation back to some stuff that you were talking about with Adrian Cockcroft again, which was sort of, I think that there is a stipulation that when we're talking about, say, continuous delivery and modern organizations, it, they sort of assume that things are going to be microservices. And certainly like at a, at a certain scale, some sort of microservice architecture makes more sense. But say if you scale down the organization size, you scale down this the system size, you know, how, like, do you think that these microservices or that type of architecture is actually a prerequisite in succeeding? Or is it just more about, because that um, speaks to the technical structure, you know, but if you have, say, a well-designed monolith where you can apply all these things and work work quickly, fix bugs and do these things, you know, where is the sort of, like, how do you view the spectrum between one side of it being a monolith versus, say, the other side being a larger distributed system? Like, is there a prerequisite that you have to be doing some specific technical architecture to succeed? Yeah, so my view on that is, and this kind of goes back to a story of modularity, right? Mm -hmm. Because in the end, and I used to think of this very much modularity in architecture first, but now I completely changed my view on software architecture Mm. to be value stream flow first. So what I think what we all want to optimize for is is faster product value stream flow. Right. And what I've learned from the data is that product value streams are between two and 10 teams. Okay. And that if you've got, let's say, one team, uh, I've certainly observed this, you can work very successfully on a mon, and you don't have any, you know, kind of, you're not making an API that people are building on or something of that sort. It's not extensible but you truly have kind of one mobile app or something, you're generally fine with one team having its own monolith, Mm -hmm. right? And it's probably the way you can move fastest because anytime you're introducing APIs or services, you've got, you know, that's basically, you're you're introducing a maintenance burden going forward. So you're introducing some kind of versioning and so on. So the challenge, of course, becomes is, you know, now when you have the second team. So the... I think the key thing is, is as soon as your number of teams grows to be a significant number, and of course, it depends on the domain you're working on, you start needing to decouple the work of the teams because dependencies between the teams' work becomes a bottleneck. And you can see that in the flow, that you have to go check with too many teams to change this one thing because you didn't know how they were using that bit of data or pushing it onto a stack or whatever they were doing, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to start, start hiding 
some implementation behind an API or a, or a microservice. And as soon as you're doing that, you're able to make the teams move faster independently. So this is really all just about the need for microservices, APIs, and basic component models is, is to allow the teams to move fast autonomously. And I think that's something that's been fairly well understood for a long time. But I think the really interesting thing is then product value streams need their own autonomy as well. Mm. But that team of teams levels construct also needs to have basically a, a way of hiding implementation so that you've got the set of APIs that can work as dependencies between product value streams. Mm. And so I think you know, that is something that absolutely the, that these microservices architectures are generally a good direction on. Right. And where I think platform thinking, where you're, for example, depending on the APIs, you treat your platforms as products with their own backlogs, and the backlogs are just additional API requests or a functionality requests from a platform. So I think the key thing is to understand that you want product values, you want teams to be able to move as fast as they can and have loose coupling between them. And you want the same thing for your product value streams. And if you look at it from a flow perspective, that means you have to invest heavily in APIs, especially these platform APIs. That means that the teams, depending on that particular part of the platform, don't need to reinvent these things themselves. Right? Mm-hmm. They, can, they can rely on a, on a common service, and that service will continue to evolve and meet their needs. So I think it's, it definitely depends on scale. right? So if you're a 50-person startup, no. Your chances are you're fine with a monolith. Right? But mm-hmm. as soon as you again, need teams to move independently, uh, you're looking at this at, at, at this way. And the, the key point that I you know, repeatedly make is that you really want to, what you want to optimize for with architecture is just fast flow within the product value streams. And that will give you the right kind of guide of when to invest in a platform or API. You do that when it's a bottleneck for feature flow and when not to. Right. And on the other end of the spectrum, you can adopt, say, an architecture like microservices too early and then really shoot yourself in the foot by introducing mm-hmm. all these dependencies and this sort of stuff that you may not actually be related to your core problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's why I think having flow be your guide is so key because I know, you know, myself when I was a developer and I, a lot of other people uh, who have I've worked with, they will over architect. Mm. And so if you're now overdoing it on the microservices on a fairly small code base that's only a couple teams, uh, you could easily again introduce more burden than benefit. Yeah. Well, that's why the importance of focusing on the like the overall flow time through all layers of decision making gets you aligned in that direction, right? It's not necessarily about making, say, maybe the best technical choice, but what will actually allow me or the team to work as fast as possible to optimize for fast flow. And that has yeah, totally changes the way that you that you think. So that speaks to the technical structure of you know the software architecture. And then of course you have the relationship between Conway's law and team structure, which is another part of the overall structure of sort of this value stream network. So how do you see like to use a book title not on purpose, but I think it works very well, the idea of team topologies in an organization. Like what's the relationship between like team architecture, software architecture, and value stream architecture? Yeah. And so I think that's a great book. And a really important contribution. And I think it gives us kind of a, a language to have this conversation, right? So my view on it is the first part of what you said is that you need to you basically optimize these things for flow. And in the end, we're, we're actually trying to optimize for flow of value that we deliver to, deliver to the market, which tends to be more on feature flow, but also you know the quality and defect size is important, the risk size is important. So... The you know the, the way that I look at it is that you all, you always want to have for any kind of architecture work or team structure or restructuring you always want to have a hypothesis that this will increase flow mm-hmm. and it will do it. Here's the other key part in a sufficiently short time window. Mm. So you know I know we used to do spend more time architecting for any kind of future options. Now, when you start thinking about flow, you really want to make architecture decisions for the six, nine, 12 month window, right? Mm-hmm. There'll be some new open source component that'll be created at that, at that point, or some new AWS or Azure service that you can consume, and so on. So, really, the hypothesis should be that my architecture change or my team structure change, which needs to support flow, will, will drive faster flow. And so, I think the, the great thing with the work like team topologies, with these modern ways of thinking about architecture, 
is that it's not that you have kind of one cookie cutter decision. Mm -hmm. It's that you actually understand the the structure and the dynamics and you can say, okay, given what we're delivering, it's really important um, that we have, you know, this one particular API team structured this way with these teams depending on it and this is the size of it and so on. You start looking at some of those team topology structures and you say, because you know, this will minimize dependencies here, which will increase their flow. And here's the key thing. And here's why I think the, this is where the flow framework really comes in, is that you can then measure whether you are right or wrong on that hypothesis. Mm, which is the whole point of doing the hypothesis. Yeah, exactly. And that's the, that's the part that, that it's amazing to me. So it's missed so often, right? Is that you have endless discussions on how we should structure things and what's optimal and so on. And that takes weeks so there's a decisions made and then every no one measures the outcome right right and so my whole point of making sure that however the, the, the flow met- the flow metrics need to be a part of your entire journey because you know you make one hypothesis you check if it did this team structure increase flow did it not if it didn't why and did we do something wrong did we not actually give the teams a chance was there not a big enough time window but but it's to me, the, the key thing is that flow metrics give you a fast feedback loop on whether architecture, uh, team structure, process automation, whether all these decisions, whether they increase flow or not, because you're constantly measuring it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny how there's the two things you brought up. One is how we have the idea of hypotheses. And, you know, we like to think of ourselves, you know, we're engineers we know how to build things, we conduct experiments, and we verify results. But that more often than not, we don't actually verify any of these results. Like We have ideas, but we kind of just do a gut check if they work or not. And this comes back to a conversation I had with Dave Farley on why he didn't really consider himself a software engineer. It's because he wasn't doing actual engineering. You know, He had an idea, and maybe he maybe had some data or not, but we don't get into this uh, feedback loop of, I have a hypothesis, I will do X and then Y should happen. Does it happen or not, right? And the flow framework gives us the metrics to do like an engineering at sort of an organizational architecture level. Yeah. But, you know, we think about value streams and, you know, they're so important and we want to optimize them. And this comes back to the third way of DevOps is the continuous learning and experimentation is that you have to continuously be doing that. And that one thing that like really kind of blew my mind about the first part of the flow framework was the the turning point in the age of software. It's just that we sort of, like me, you know, I exist in this bubble where I sort of assume that organizations are doing these things that work like this. But then you look at some of the numbers and it's like, man, there's only like one, five percent of companies working like this. So how how do we spread this this knowledge and the way of working with the wider industry who's maybe not encountered this kind of philosophy before? Yeah. So I think the, the key thing here is, and again, I think this whole point of continuous improvement, I think it's, it's basically, it needs to be based on data, right? Mm-hmm. Software is complex enough. If you want to thrive in this age, regardless of the size of your company, regardless of your industry, if you're not measuring, you don't have a feedback loop to how you're improving on your delivery practices, you're going to fall behind. And if you don't have the right way of collecting and measuring that data or the right way of reasoning about it and using it not with these proxy metrics, but again, with, with flow metrics, then you have to assume you're going to fall behind or you're just going to follow the latest trend or some fad on tooling or process improvement or methodology or something else. But if you have that guide that's telling you, okay, when we deployed this, this new methodology uh, or this new team topology or this new tool, flow increased. You mm-hmm. actually... Start that process, which to me I think is, is just so critical. And Carmen Diardo, um, one of my colleagues, came up with this of data-driven continuous improvement. Mm-hmm. Right. So we know that continuous improvement is important. We're seeing that through literature. We're seeing that as the improvement of daily work is one of Gene Kim's five ideals, and we need data for it. Software is too complex to do it without data. So, uh, so I think bottom line is I think the, the way that I think it's uh, it's fairly simple to explain is you need the data to improve and you need to measure the, the flow metrics to do it. And that will get you onto the path of innovation because you do have a lot of these organizations who've just been at this for so long, they're always doing it. They're, they're all, they always know where their bottlenecks are and that's, that's all they're, they're always examining it. And yet so many organizations, large and small, have not done that, right? And it is purely based on speculation or opinion. And when it comes time to making these really big decisions, 
if you don't have established this culture of, of continuous improvement mm. with data, um, again, you can make quite a few missteps in a row. Yeah. And it's just funny to me how much time we spend like in this whole area as engineers or thinking about business and relationship between these value streams is just how important it is to get data and act on data like as a first principle. That even in like technological driven fields, we still don't operate that way by default. Anyway, I want to ask you one last question to make sure we get you out of here on time. So I think you published the Flow Framework in 20, was it 2018 or 2019? 2018, the end of 2018, right? End of 2018, right? So now you've, the book's been out in the wild. The ideas have been in the wild. You've, have, you know, you've had conversations. You see how people think about this, how they react. What's kind of your retrospective on this? I mean, what do you think has worked or not worked? Like what's clear? Where do people have questions and what do you think's next? Yeah. One really interesting thing is I was expecting the to want to change and evolve more of the flow framework. I, I thought it would be a year before I wanted to make some really significant changes. Mm. But the the you know, or or someone discovered a fifth flow item, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> Because that okay. was kind of you know it's kind of a challenge. I, I basically said like no, there's just these four. There, there's there's actually just four. Uh, so the interesting thing is it's how well it has stood that test of time from the point of view of structure. Not not that it's been that much time, and it will evolve over time. And we're learning like with some customers right now, we're actually learning how to apply it to mixed hardware, software systems, and IoT. Right, mm. where you've got sort of two different types of value streams going in parallel. Um, one on the hardware and firmware side and one of the software. And the interesting thing is the flow items uh, still apply, the core concepts still apply, but there's some new ways that we're thinking about extending that a little bit. So I think the interesting thing is it's worked. The thing and the structure is working in terms of helping organizations do this, right? Which is fundamentally all, all I care about in the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, the thing I wish I had done a bit more of is to help understand the different kinds of product value streams that organizations have and the importance of these internal platform value streams and wow. the thinking of the value stream network itself, your tool chain itself as a product and so on, because because that's where a lot of organizations get hung up. So I've definitely done a bit more work on that lately. I think there's some things in it that you know can still be leveraged to help with these journeys, like those those indexes that it has, like the alignment index, mm. how, how product aligned are you? Are, are areas where I think there's there's a there's a lot more organizations can gain from those things. But right now, I think what I'm really happy about in terms of what's the immediate value it's delivered to organizations is just highlighting those four flow items, modeling them out, and just the simple. And this will go back to that to, to what you're saying, Adam, about the Adrian Cochran podcast because I thought you know he's Adrian's just got some fascinating ideas oh, yeah. um, and experience and. Just the simple fact of focusing on one flow metric, just on flow time, just how transformational that can be because it has you think to end to end and it gets you started rather than thinking you need to be, you know, have a perfect agile and DevOps deployment to get started. No, you start with measuring Mm -hmm. and then again, using data to drive further improvement. And just how transformative to a lot of organizations, elevating debt, technical debt and risks has been because those Mm -hmm. kind of... Do, t- do tend to get ignored, do tend to cause the development teams a lot of stress because they're always trying to keep up with them and then they're not being properly uh, scheduled or accounted for or prioritized. So yeah, I think the, you know, the key thing right now is to take, and what I'm focused on is taking the, the outcomes of these flow diagnostics to help provide uh, better guidelines and have our teams provide better guidelines to how to improve, right? To the fact that, you know, what the anti patterns are if you're under-investing in your platforms because it's something that we so often see. One of the things that we see most consistently is, is too much flow load, right? That's mm-hmm. because if you're ignoring debt and risk, you by definition you have too much flow load because you've got all this invisible work. Yeah. So yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's been some of the key learnings. So when you said sort of educating around different kinds of product value streams. And you, you mentioned uh, like internal platforms. Are you talking about like internal platform teams who are sort of like a, maybe a horizontal team for other teams inside the organization? Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so see, exactly. I did not do this well enough in the book. It's, uh, it's there's we don't have great common definitions of this, but I think it's such an important concept, which is the fact that you've got your business facing products, right? Those face the customer. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you've got the products that those build on. Those are your platforms, your APIs, your services. 
Yeah. And then below that, you've actually got the tool chain itself. So your, your agile and DevOps tooling, which, and you need to treat each of those as its own product mm -hmm. that has its own roadmap and its own backlog and treat those internal things as first class products, which is what pretty much every tech company knows to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of organizations that have not come from a technology background don't. They, they basically think there's, you've got this IT, make stuff work, and we've got a bunch of business products. Uh, rather than actually understanding the structure of their product and value stream portfolio. Yeah, and I agree with your point, Mick, on why team topologies are so important, because at least it gives us a common vernacular to discuss these type of things, how it relates to the structure of organizations. And even in team topologies, there's a focus of value stream aligned teams, platform teams, supporting teams, like how they all how the structure of these teams actually fits into the whole network, the value stream network, and the each kind of the role it plays in the whole dance of delivering all this stuff. Exactly. So Mick, it was uh, my pleasure to talk to you. I'm so happy you came on the show and talked to us about the Flow Framework and Project Product and Value Stream Networks, all this stuff. I think it's so important to the work we do as engineers and also for those of us who are really focused on business results, which is something that the Flow Framework really brings to the forefront of the daily work. So thank you again for coming on the show. Is there anything you'd like to leave the audience with before we go? Uh, no, my pleasure, Adam. Thanks for the great work that you've been doing around this and, and helping educate people on it. It's, it's, it's great to see. I think, uh, yeah, I think the main thing is, is, you know, just for people to get started with this now. It's uh, once you, everyone's got sort of the same scorecard with, <laughs> we'll just say starting with flow time. Uh, it's amazing how, much, how, how positive this is from a culture point of view, right? Everyone's got the same goal of, of reducing the flow time and delivering more. And taking all the impediments out of the way, and trusting their teams to then to build off of that and and thrive. So yeah, uh, thank you. And yeah, you can find more on the book and and me on projecttoproject.org. Yeah, and also Mick has a podcast, uh, Mick Plus One, where he talks about all this kind of stuff with different guests. And you had Adrian Cockcroft on recently, and another most recent episode was kind of on develop, developer productivity. Some good stuff there. So if you like podcasts, be sure to check out Mick Plus One. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening. That wraps up this batch. Visit smallbatches.fm for the show notes. Also find Small Batches FM on Twitter and leave your comments in the thread for this episode. More importantly, subscribe to this podcast for more episodes just like this one. If you enjoyed this episode, then tweet it or post it to your team Slack or rate this show on iTunes. It all supports the show and helps me produce more Small Batches. Well, I hope to have you back again for the next episode. So until then, happy shipping. Want to learn more about DevOps without wasting your time? Then sign up for my free email course at freedevopscourse.com. My course combines the best from the DevOps handbook, Accelerate, and years of software delivery experience. You'll learn the three ways of DevOps and the four KPIs of software delivery performance. More importantly, I'll show you how to put that theory into practice. That means shipping better software faster. Sign up today at freedevopscourse.com. Like the sound of small batches? This episode was produced by Podsworth Media. That's podsworth.com.